Okay. All right, we're on. We're goodness gracious, that was loud. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen, y'all. I'm just going to give a quick introduction. I see people are already saying where they're from. That's awesome. Please do that. Um, we'll see if our friends from Australia and New Zealand are here. I'm going to share my screen really fast. Um, All right, here we go. Um, welcome. It's the We Believe in Comics Friday Night Workshops at the Sequential Artist Workshop. That's where you are. Thanks for being here. Yay, it's another Friday night. I'm so excited. Or Friday evening or Friday afternoon, wherever you are, or Saturday morning. Um, so we are a school. We have courses. We're a nonprofit school. You can find us at learn.sawcomics.org if you haven't been there before. Take a look. Um, Whoa, I think I flipped some things around. Oh, that's fine. Next week, um, we're going to be riffing on the tarot with Roxanne Palmer, July 15th. And starting in September, the year-long certificate program, uh, you'll be learning storytelling, narrative, history, context, reading, idea generating, drawing, art, finishing help, professional practices, culminating in a final anthology of group work. There's so much that happens in that program. So I hope you'll reach out if you have any interest in that or questions in it. It's a great program. We only do it once a year, sort of goes along the same uh, same timeline as a college course, September to May or so. Um, if you want a less intensive, we have free and uh, a couple tiers that you can join us in. Again, that's at sawcomics.org. Go check that out. Um, if you want to share anything, you can share it on social media with the hashtag Friday Night Comics. We're at Comics Workshop. Um, you can also slide on over to the members.sawcomics.org website and share with us there. Lots of people sharing stuff there. Um, we thrive on tuitions and donations, and I want to thank everybody who donated to today's workshop. That helps keep these alive. I really appreciate it. It's really helping a lot, and it helps uh, some of our some of our initiatives. Um, we offered a lot in tuitions last year to all sorts of people um, donated to various causes. Uh, we have this artist in residence program that it helped fund and stuff like that. You can see all that on our website, somewhere on our website. <laughs> okay, so the usual no inappropriate speech or imagery, please. We will permanently ban you, blah, blah, blah. Enjoy. I'm really happy that Natalie Norris is back. Um, this is her Instagram and this is her link tree. Notice if you go to the Instagram, it's three underscores there. We got it wrong. It was, we only had two ones. But anyway, Natalie is here again. And let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing. There we go. Natalie, I'm gonna spotlight you in just a second. In fact, Maybe. how about now? And um, I just wanna say, I've, I've said this to you and a couple of our students know this too, but you inspired us so much. We've got so many people writing writing stories in letter format after your oh, last yeah. workshop. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. So we're really happy to have you back. So um, I'm going to sort of turn my camera off or, or at least my audio. And uh, But if you have any questions or need me, just, just shout. Sure. Thank right. you so much, Tom. All right. So supplies that you guys are going to need is basically just anything that you like to draw with, paper, some kind of drawing implement. Um, it's really up to you. And I'm going to do a little talk um, for about 10 minutes, and then we'll do the exercise and then leave ample time for sharing. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. Everyone seeing that OK? Yep. Okay. So thank you for coming to my workshop, Mapping Out Memoir, Approaching the Past from a Bird's Eye View. And like Tom said, I'm Natalie Norris. So I want to start by introducing myself. Some of you know me. Some of you did the last workshop. Um, but I'm a cartoonist. And specifically, I work in graphic memoir. And I just think that comics are the perfect medium for telling personal stories. 
I graduated from CCS in 2020, and I'm still living in Vermont. Uh, before that, I was a studio art major at Kenyon College, and I did a bunch of different things, different mediums, um, including the stop motion animation and printmaking, but mostly I've always been drawn to storytelling. I also get to work in a comics library, which is really an amazing place to work and do lots of reading. And most importantly, I am a devoted dog mother, and that is Gwen. <laughs> She's on my lap. Maybe she will poke her head up later today. So um, like Tom said, you can find me online, and I'd really love it if you would tag me in your posts that you share um, today or whenever you share those, Natalie Norris, triple underscore in between. Um, and then, of course, hashtag Friday Night Comics. So right now I am working on my first book. It's a graphic memoir called Dear Minnie, and it's a coming of age story that deals with trauma, sexuality, um, resiliency, and friendship. And I work traditionally, so I draw um, pen and ink and watercolors. And um, the first volume, they're gonna be published by Fantagraphics, and the first volume will be out this spring. I'm also serializing it on Patreon, so if you do want to read it before then, feel free. I'm almost done. I have like two chapters left. Um, yeah, and my work is does tend to be 18 plus, so if you're looking for it on Patreon, you have to go um, directly to the site. It doesn't allow you to search for accounts that are 18 plus, so it's um, patreon.com slash dearmini, the name of the book. Place is a very important theme in my book, Dear Many, um, since the book takes place across four different countries, which are Austria, Italy, France, and America. I've always loved maps. Um, they have their own visual language that is really similar to comics um, because they rely on the intersection of words. Oh, there's my little Gwen. Um, <laughs> words and images, and they tell a story. As a child, I would draw maps of everything, my house, my neighborhood, my mom's garden where I buried hidden treasure, and of course, endless fantasy maps. Maps can be a window into a certain moment in time. Their styles and the icons used can tell you a lot about the person and culture who made them. What are the myths um, that are represented about the unknown? Before satellites, cartography was a rather subjective endeavor, and it revealed a lot about the beliefs and understandings of the map maker. Maps are a place where fantasy and reality collide. So what fantastical creatures live on the margins of old maps, like these mermaids here on the left? And how do they help root us in a sense of reality when we're dealing with fantasy worlds, like this map of Middle Earth? So often fantasy stories will start with a map to create the context for this new world. This is also true for memoir. Uh, memoirs are an expression of memory that we make tangible for other people to read and experience. One of the goals of the genre is to give the reader enough context that they can follow along in your footsteps as if they were their own. Maps can show a journey through obstacles, like in Azina Aberach's A Game for Swallows, which takes place in Beirut during the Lebanese Civil War. On the left, she shows us the view of her neighborhood and the physical barriers between her childhood home and her grandparents. And then on the right, she shows us how they actually traveled between the two places, including annotations to describe their movements like run, jump, climb, it's a vivid portrait of a place that we can't actually see. Alison Bechdel is known for her meticulous and analytical approach to memoir, so it's no surprise that maps appear several times in Fun Home. On the left, she compares her hometown to the Wildwood from The Wind in the Willows. The fantasy map is illustrated and dynamic in contrast to the topographical map below. Despite the parallels she is drawing between the two, we are also aware of the differences. On the right, she helps to make sense of her father's life and death within a three-quarter mile radius. 
Contextualizing tragedy with a map is one device that Durf back Durf uses in Kent State. Having a map at the beginning of the book allows the reader to refer back throughout the story. And this is especially important when you're telling a complex narrative that relies on specific logistical moments and encompasses an entire community. So viewing place from different angles and vantage points provides a change of perspective, literally and figuratively. Here are four drawings of the same apartment at the beginning of Phoebe Gleckner's Diary of a Teenage Girl. And each one provides different information and new context to better understand how the house fits into the block and the larger neighborhood and the city of San Francisco. The annotated floor plan on the right, the top right page, um, provides a particularly intimate look into her apartment that helps the reader understand the protagonist's relationship to space. So one of the benefits, a silver lining, uh, to living during a time with immense digital surveillance is that we currently have unprecedented amounts of visual re reference information at our fingertips. And one of my favorite tools is Google Maps, Satellite, and Street View. Essentially, we can create what Phoebe drew for us just with a cute, quick address search. Here's her apartment nestled between the other buildings on her block, just like we saw in the previous slide. And I'll go back and see her drawing. And don't worry, they don't live there anymore, so we're not stalking them. My book is mostly set in Austria, and I was there for one week 11 years ago, and I didn't take many photos. Um, yet I've been able to find many of the important locations via Google Maps. This part of my process often feels more like being a private investigator than a cartoonist. I know some memoirists who prefer not to rely heavily on source material, and I tend to approach different parts of the story with different levels of journalistic accuracy. But for moments set in different countries, it felt important to get the cultural background correct. It also had the emotional effect of helping me feel like I was being transported there. So my process for creating this book actually started with a map. Three years ago, I decided I wanted to find the place where the central events of my book take place. Before I started my search via satellite, I drew this little map here on the left. A few hours later, I located the building, and it was almost a direct match to what I had remembered. Several details confirmed for me that this was the place. At the time, I wasn't planning to make this story into a comic, but it would, would be, and it would be several months before I decided that I wanted to. But I find, um, but I think finding these visuals and locating this place, which for me only existed in a brief moment in time, but in reality was still there, taking up concrete space, this planted the seed that eventually I would decide to make this story come to life. I think this ability of our brains to um, being able to translate the experiences on the ground to how things look from the sky can be a really powerful thing to play around with. Making memoir comics can feel very emotionally intense. So sometimes it helps to zoom out a bit and view a situation or a place from a different perspective. And that's what we're gonna work on right now. So we've talked a lot about maps as supplemental material to a comic, but they can also tell a story all on their own and even be the genesis for new comics ideas. So this is gonna be a three-part process. And if you wanna get your um, drawing implements uh, ready, we can move on to step one. So first, I want you to start by jotting down a list of places that hold a lot of emotional weight. This can be a house, a neighborhood, a city, even a country if you're feeling ambitious. You could also zoom in further and do one room. Um, and I'm gonna give you three minutes so as you get set up, I will also get set up with the timer and then I'll put a little music on. Hey, Natalie, is there something below neighborhood in that slide? It's getting cut off for some of us. Or maybe it's maybe maybe that is the whole thing. The neighborhood. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I hope the whole thing wasn't cut off. But... It might have been a tiny bit. OK. And I will start the timer. So we have three minutes. 
about 30 more seconds. move on to step two, which is take a moment to choose one place from your list and try and go with the one that just feels like the most emotionally resonant right now, sort of calling out to you. And then we're going to take another three minutes um, to make a list of sensory information um before we move into drawing so what does this place smell like what sounds can you hear what does it feel like is it cold hot stuffy windy um what objects or surfaces can you touch or emotions that you feel and any tastes associated with this place foods you ate um or things you may have consumed so anything that comes to mind that's in the sensory realm. And again, we're just listing these out. So we'll do that for another three minutes.
about 30 seconds. to move on to the final stage, which is actually drawing the map. So this can be taking the perspective of a bird if it's a neighborhood, or you can be a fly on the bedroom wall, um, and really make sure that you annotate it a lot and include lots of sensory detail. And if any stories come up while you're drawing, feel free to like jot those down or do a little doodle um anything that feels like it could become a comic later so yeah we're gonna work on this for about 15 minutes and then we will have 20 minutes to share and if you have any questions just let me know Natalie, a question. Can we cheat yes. and check Google Maps? Oh, if you think you can draw enough in 15 minutes and look, you're welcome to. But I also think it's fun to exercise your brain and then check Google Maps later. But I leave that up to you. <laughs> and also, don't worry about like drawing it to scale or including everything. Like, It's more about the emotional experience. Thanks. Yeah.
We have about three minutes. Just a few more seconds. All right. So, Tom, do you want to take it away with spotlighting people? Sure. Um, I'll remove your spotlight. And Natalie, if you wouldn't mind, go to your reactions and raise your hand, and I'll do the same. And that, that sort of pushes us up to the front. Sure. Um, and then people who want to share. Oh, and also, I think you have to stop sharing your screen. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, stop sharing. Yeah. yeah, and raise your hand if you don't mind. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, if anyone wants to share, I know I do, but I don't want to be the person who goes. I, okay, good. We're getting some people. This was fun. I've, I've thought about this place that, that I drew, but I, I you know, over and over and over again, but never in an organized way. So it was really fun to sort of like organize it all in that way. Okay. Get some other people who have something else to offer as well. Okay, so we've got some people lined up, Holly, Audrey, Marlene, and Nina in that order. So Holly, if you're ready, I'll, I'll spotlight you. Um, there we go. Hi there, this was so great. I actually have this sitting on my desk right now that wow. I had completed before a memory map of my childhood home, including all these locations. But going through this little process of thinking of the sensory stuff, 
really brought up a ton of memories. Um, so I had a lot of fun jotting those down. I didn't get very far working on my one from today. I really wanted to enlarge it and think more mm. about the stuff. So I have a lot to do, but I couldn't believe that this was kind of that pathway when this was sitting here on my desk waiting for me to take it to the next step. So that was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for That's tonight. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. And I look forward to seeing what you do. Holly, do you want to tell us what anything, any detail about that place? Yeah, so I can show a little bit. There's memories. Mm -hmm. I put numbers for the memories. Um, and so we had about two and a half acres and played a lot out in the woods. So I have a lot of memories out in the woods and I've tried to number them as well as the houses and the garden. Um, I've been working on some memory projects for my family, making zines of our childhood memories. Um, and I've just completed the first one and now I'm working on the second one. So I wanted to include a memory map on my, in my second zine. So that's why I was sitting out on my art desk. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's so awesome. I guess, yeah, one memory is that we would call the little viney maple trees elevators because we would grab a hold of one of them to jump down from the tree fort. Okay. That was our elevator. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, we'll go to Audrey next. Thanks so much. Hi there. So I did a, a rough map and then I'm, I would like to go back and uh, expand on it. So this would be the mm. map of my studio that my husband built for me. And then I've, I've just, you know, every, a lot of this stuff that's in there all has a story. I got this, uh, this antique old door that I, re that I scraped all the gunky old paint off of. And then there's these two school lockers, you know, the ones with the, with the little doors. Cause it's like about five mm -hmm. or six doors where you just shoved your books in. And I got this free from a garage sale. The guy didn't want it. Got this beautiful old, uh, old bar. Um, when you, you can lift up a lid and you can see the old retro little martini sticks in there and they've got lovely cupboards and drawers for more storage. Um, this old paper cabinet with the, the, the thin, the thin um, shelves you can just shove papers in. Um, an old, uh, old dressing table that I got and refurbished for my um, sewing machine and the, the drafting table my mom and dad gave me. And so then I got the windows that look out into the forest. So I'd like to draw, you know, the owls and the, the, the birds and stuff that I, mm -hmm. that I have, uh, that, I, that I see out there. So this was a, a lot of fun to, to do. Thank you so much. It's cool, it, like all the objects seem to have their own history and story. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in there, so <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. We'll go to Marlene next. Um, oh, wait, I think Marlene just disappeared. I might have to wait for her to come back and do video. Okay, we'll go to Nina, then we'll come back to Marlene. You ready? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, this was a lot of fun and something I really need to do. Uh, this is my uh -huh. childhood neighborhood of Regal Park, Queens. And um, I lived on this Alderton Street and my grandparents owned a duplex where we had a gas station next door, which it always smelled like gas. Thanks for the whole sensory thing. Right. And there was a pizzeria that smelled amazing right here. Mm. And the Long Island Railroad ran through our backyard. So there was all the noise of the trains constantly, freight trains, regular trains. And um, it would shake my fish tank and all my fish would fall out of the tank. I would go down to the pet store, which was um, right near the library, which I loved. And there was a big fire and the whole block burned down at one point. And then my best friend, Kara, lived across the street on Elwell Crescent. And she had a, a, one of those swimming pools that, you know, they put on above ground. And Kara and I would run the whole neighborhood and we were little, but we would cross this massive Queens Boulevard by going into the subway station and going underneath. So, I mean, all these different things, there's Chick, the one-eyed butcher who was in the supermarket and then the candy store where my brother and I were given like a dollar and we could fill a bag with candy. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to walk to uh, my elementary school, which was like almost a mile by myself. And then I couldn't make it home one day and I peed my tights right about there. Oh. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> anyway, this is, this is, this is, there's a lot more, but that's all I could cram in there. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. That's like a whole childhood memoir right there. <laughs> totally. I mean, totally. <laughs> oh, and the scary house where we were told they gave out um, apples with razors at Halloween. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Nina. Check the chat too. You got some neighbors. Um, we'll go to Marlene <laughs> next. Here we go. Hi there. I'm speaking from um, Sydney, Australia. Ooh. And uh, what I've got, um, just to thank Natalie for her inspiration, I didn't think I could do this. But what I've got is my childhood home in Africa. Mm. So I migrated from South Africa to, to Sydney. And you can see the map of Africa. The city that I was born in is called Johannesburg. Mm. And um, you can see the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean on either side of Africa. And also um, a, a, a sketch of my parental home. Sorry, this year, mm -hmm. uh, it was a semi-detached and we lived in the one done in a highlight. Mm -hmm. And so the next um, frame shows um, uh, our neighbor who was doing illicit selling of liquor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we called it a shabin and all kinds of people, both respectable and non-respectable used to go there for some refreshment after work. And um, so mom used to greet all of them. She was very um, open-hearted and um, she didn't see any wrong in anybody and, and greeted whether they were in rags or in riches, she, she would greet them and offer them a cup of tea mm. and cake. As you can see, tea and cake over here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, everybody was welcome at my mom's home. And we as children and teenagers used to think, oh, no, look how smelly, look how dirty they are. But she didn't care. She would invite them in because of the kind of person she was. Mm. The next frame shows mom. And uh, she's standing in front of her home. And uh, she's looking to see who she can greet. So there you can see uh, her standing. I'm just trying to move away all these other things so I can explain to you. Um, and at the back, uh, she had her backyard with veggies and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Last one, I happened to buy a Zephyr car for our convenience with my first teaching job. Guess what mom did? When we went to the supermarket, she'd get all the grannies <laughs> with the bags and say, okay, are you going home? Listen, open up the boot, put all their things in the boot and sit in the car until everybody's ready. So you can see <laughs> all the people in my car, I'm driving. And I felt like the local taxi for all mom's friends. <laughs> um, I, I was really annoyed. Now I can see the reason for her commitment to the older people who had no transportation and no means to pay for it. And so today I am really comfortable in a nursing home myself. I've got every convenience I can have. Mm -hmm. And I do believe it's God blessings, God's blessing to me. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, thank you. This is such an interesting um, portrait of a place and then the people in it. Awesome. Thanks, it showed me. Yeah, it showed me how to use um, map work, which I love, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, depict a narrative. Uh, just interesting. Thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> cool. OK, we'll go to um, Chris. Here we go. Uh, this was quite challenging. I remembered a lot of things, but the place that I thought of was about 35 years ago, back in the late 80s, when I worked at a restaurant in downtown San Francisco. Uh, there was a woman named Joyce Goldstein who opened up a restaurant um, that was, it shared a kitchen, but it was two separate restaurants. One was sort of formal and snooty, 
And the other one was quick and just for lunch, but Joyce would come in every morning and I would make her espressos. And uh, we would serve lunch to the, to the business people. And we had a very simple menu. It was pizza margarita and some kind of romaine salad um, mm -hmm. that had like six different vinegars in the, in the vinaigrette. And so, um, and then uh, this kind of restaurant, like the, the cooks were all kind of crazy a little bit and they were all, <laughs> you know, really interesting people. And one of them had this funky little three wheeler type motorcycle and my I used to park my motorcycle next to her motorcycle and occasionally I'd have to rush espresso beans to some other cafe in North Beach um and I couldn't figure out how to draw half the stuff that I was thinking of but, but <laughs> yeah. it's great making a map <laughs> yeah this is great and I love that there's like little images to help yeah. orient you yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank thanks you. a lot thanks <laughs> wonderful thanks Chris we'll go to Shay next Hello. Hello. Um, I drew. This is Florida. It's so weird because it looks mm. back to me now. <laughs> but I live in Florida and it, it kind of looks like a gun. I just feel like the state does. And it sometimes <laughs> feels like I'm living in a gun here. And I live between alligators and sharks. It's just the reality of the situation. It's not even that mm -hmm. cliche. And that little dot of the eye there above Lake Okeechobee, which is really big down there for the mouth. And um, it's really hot outside all the time, especially right now and humid. And I live in a place called Zephyr Hills, which is known for our bottled water, which is good to stock up on for when the hurricanes are aimed at you, which they do seem to be regularly. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of used to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. When you zoom in, um, this is where my house is. And I've kind of been drawing a comic lately that, you know, it has like a chicken in a coop. And I kind of feel like my house is the coop. Mm -hmm. And my closest neighbor is my pet or my pet ducks. I actually have five, but I based a comic character after one of my ducks. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> It's also kind of like the headquarters for my little superhero team. It's all about masking for COVID and we mask because I'm a higher risk household. So it's really important for us here. And uh, we have a lot of little tables set up outside for entertaining people that are spaced out. And I have everything kind of just perfectly situated in my house. So I kind of feel like it's a headquarters. <laughs> and then some of the places that are in my comic that I write about are like the circus, which is just like a, any place that's not well ventilated and crowded and kind of crazy. And then I have a, another one that I did like an open top cook circus that's more ventilated and more of a safe place to go like mm -hmm. the farmer's markets that I visit. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom, there's this kind of a labyrinth and it represents any place that's kind of in between those two that's kind of hard to navigate with um, being a higher risk person. And it actually was an experience. I went to a labyrinth at a church on World Labyrinth mm -hmm. Day and they had one outside, but then they had this really crowded inside area that was kind of crazy mm -hmm. to get through. And my whole thing was it's harder to get through a straight hallway inside than it was to go through a real labyrinth. Right. <laughs> so wow. a story there. <laughs> you, I love how you had the zooming in and the zooming out. So you have like more context for each of the places. Thank you. Well, it was thanks so much. Activity. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shay. We'll go to Erla next. So um, I grew up in Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, so our house was on the edge of a valley. And there was four teenagers who were all born within five years or four kids in five years. Wow. So this is our house at the edge of town. So this is kind of, it's called the Seasons of, of 106 McDonald Road with teens. Mm -hmm. so you've got your neighbor across here when my mom says, could you watch our house for us while we're gone? And she said, I always do, because that was like Mrs. Kravitz. <laughs> and then you've got um, a parking lot with four um, cars, uh, four teenagers vying where to uh, either neck or smoke pot. <laughs> and then I was thinking about my mom and dad, and they're kind of like, you know, in the background. But then I was thinking about all the doors and windows in our house. So, so like our house small house it was like busting at the seams with um with four teenagers and it was like a revolving door because we're always coming and going it was like a shoe sales with all these shoes at the at the entranceway 
And then there's my dad who's got, um, he's got a little office here. Uh, he's a stamp collector. He's always writing people. But every once in a while, he'd say, like from the kitchen window, come and look at the sunset. And he was a quiet man, but we'd all, oh, dad. But we had this 300 degree view of sunset. So mm. I'm not sure how to, um, to portray that. Then my brothers, who'd make an igloo in the backyard. And then mm -hmm. we, so we were on the top of a hill. So that's why we could see so far away. And there was a great big long hill. And then this was Dead Man's Rock because mm -hmm. like us girls, we we're always scared of hitting it, but the guys loved to make a little shoot. And then <laughs> my sister and I, so we'd walk quite a distance and we'd find a pond to skate on. Just little mm -hmm. things like that was so fun. And I remember my dad saying to my mom, oh, you're the vacuum cleaner's part of your anatomy. So that's her with her arm. <laughs> and uh, I remember um, from the top, I could hear a meadow lark that goes, so that was so much fun. Thank you so much. Oh, cool. Yeah, I love all of these little anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> it was Thank lots you. of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Erla. We'll go to Cheryl next. I drew my, um, let's see if this works. There we go. It's backwards for me, but hopefully I can do it. Um, starting from the bottom, it was my neighbor's house. We called him the Renaissance Man. And I went trick-or-treating there um, for the first time when he moved in and he had a pumpkin with a walkie-talkie and he was like really scary in the, in the walkie-talkie and the pumpkin. And then I did some babysitting for them. And I remember being in the five-year-old's room and he had this like Sesame Street sign in his room. And I was like, what does scene mean? And he like looked at me and I'm like, that thing over there, he's like, well, that's my name, it's Sean. <laughs> um, the kids would uh, slide down the stairs inside on in like sleeping bags. And I got 50 bucks for babysitting over 10 kids one night. Oh, and then I, I calculated it later and I realized I get like $20 at the end of the week for two kids and I was making $2 an hour. <laughs> um, they had a trampoline in the backyard and I like dug my nails into some kid's neck. Not the kids I was babysitting. And I left a crazy mark. Um, the little girl would suck the tuna juice out of the tuna can in the kitchen when I'd make macaroni and cheese and tuna for them. And they had, um, he was having like a coffee on his porch and he saw like something moving in the grass and he like gets up quiet and he like sneaks down halfway down the stairs and he jumps from the middle of the stairs and he lands on the mole hole and he killed the mole. And he had a forest behind the house and in the winter time he would set a hose over the forest and then he'd make this like magical icicle castle and it was fabulous. Wow. That was awesome. so Thanks. cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. We'll go to Jeannie. Jeannie, are you calling yourself Jean or Jeannie? Yeah, I forgot to rename it. Um, I'm Jeannie. I don't know who that is. I mean, I don't know who that person is. I'm Jeannie. All right. I didn't think I was going to be able to do this, especially in 15 minutes, it's what everybody else is saying. And I just really loved it. This, this is a map of my, my daughter's farm that she calls Medium Farm because she says the medium is the soil. She graduated from art school and um, that is her medium. And she's turned two plots of land. She doesn't own the land, but the landowners really like the fact that she's turning their land into um, an organic farm. So um, she gets to farm it yeah. and she built a wonderful cooling shed. Um, this is where my car is. This is the, st the street that it's on and um, it's called Balhachi. Um, and if you know who Richard Diebenkorn, the painter is, he used to live on that street in Healdsburg, which is where it is. Anyway, and we think this is a meth house because a lot of crazy stuff comes out of it. And there's like 50 cars that are parked there. And it's like, I don't know how they even move their cars. Anyway, whatever, but that just adds some color. And this, these are some hops and just some of the things that she, my daughter Miriam grows. And my other daughter and I go up every, every other weekend and dig in the dirt 
dig in the dirt so there's a smell of dirt and the smell of fresh growing green plants. There's all kinds of birds. There's um, love and peace and well-being and lots of hard work and pulling weeds. And I just spend the whole weekend laughing with my daughters. It's fantastic. It is heaven on earth. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I love the way you draw plants. Like I just immediately got the sense that it was a very um, lush area. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And she <laughs> she has great attitude towards weeds. I mean, if they help the plant, she leaves them. So I have to be very careful. I have to ask her which ones I can. Yeah. Well, awesome. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeannie. If Janine's on, we'll go to Janine. Um, Otherwise, we'll go to Susan and wait for Janine to come back. Um, oh, there we go. Oh. Um, so uh, I love doing maps. This is just an old one. I just want to Ooh. show because something has already changed so much, but this is just an old uh, garden one. But um, I love the, that's more recent, but um, days and it got me thinking that I drew one once that was, I made a pretend city that was just all the different houses I've ever lived in, but I put them all on like one sneaky street and then wrote things about all each place. And I wish I could show that, but anyway, so That's this awesome. is, um, this is my, uh, the first art studio that I lived in. Mm. And um, it was, people used to call me cave girl because <laughs> There was only one window over here, a north facing window in this whole space, and the door was over here. But um, it was an old factory building, and it had like, I don't even think it was 15 foot, I think it was like 18 foot high ceilings. The ceilings were just so incredibly high. But um, it was, it was when I got my uh, beloved cat, Serafina, who was with me for 18 years. I got her when she was three months old. Wow. And um, yeah, so so many different memories. These are velvet 1930s club chairs, <laughs> a glass uh, coffee table, a bed set up like a couch with antique velvet pillows. I used to sell antiques while I was trying to learn how to do art. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Piles of uh, luggage and hat boxes and giant mound of trash bags because <laughs> at one point, I was too depressed and I wouldn't do my laundry. So I just buy more vintage clothes and throw them in a bag and, you know. <laughs> oh, and the last thing, this is a wall of books. And one time it fell on me. Oh. And the walls were so thin, the neighbors could hear and they ran over and like rescued me. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I didn't get hurt. We all just were like, oh my God. <laughs> wow. That's such a vivid portrait of a confined but very dynamic space <laughs> thank you well thanks so much janine we'll go to susan next and susan is hosting the after party right i am all right so hi the... folks Hello. so um this is washington island which mm. is off the tip of um, door county in wisconsin and i went to this island for a week pretty much every summer in the 2000s mm. between a, a big stressful job and um, helping my parents who are getting older and approaching death. And so for those of us who fairies are what you do on vacation, they're mm. like, they are a fairy that takes you away to a magical place. Mm -hmm. And so you would ride the ferry, get off at the ferry dock and there with the cars and the tickets and then you'd go around. This was a local, you know, kind of a local place called the Red Cup where they had great coffee, great pastries mm -hmm. and a lot of incense and um, greeting cards. Mm -hmm. And then my favorite thing to do was to sit in the Adirondack chair on the shore with a cup of wine mm -hmm. and my knitting or my sketchbook and listen to the birds. What was really interesting to me was the water on the southern part of the island mm -hmm. was a greenish color and the water on the northern part of the island was blue. And I never really mm -hmm. understood that. This had sandy bottoms and up here it was like these really small round soft rocks with signs all over the place. Don't take them because that's mm -hmm. what makes that beach special. I 
Joe stayed in a, a hotel called the Washington Hotel. I'd often go the week after Labor Day in which they'd hand me the keys and give me their cell phone number and leave. So it was me <laughs> in this big, scary hotel. And they said, well, do you think the ax members come across on the ferry? <laughs> you know? um, and I'd ride my bicycle all around the places. There was a church here and they had the softest sheets ever in my whole life. And so I had to buy some of those sheets to take them home. Wow. I love that. And I love that you explained because I immediately saw the green and the blue and I was curious mm -hmm. about what that, um, yeah. yeah, what caused that. Thank you. <laughs> well, Susan, thanks. All right, we'll go to Kai next. Hey, hey, hi. Um, <laughs> hi, thanks so much for this, Natalie. It was so cool because I ended up drawing um, the bedroom where I gave birth to my first daughter and I had drawn oh. this from so many different perspectives, but never without people in it. So it was a really interesting experiment for me. So this oh, cool. is the bed and I thought this is where she was going to be born. And then mm. she was in, she ended up coming out here on the floor. Yeah. Um, it was like best laid plans, right? Um, right. But uh, so here's an oxygen tank and I had mm. a breast pump on, which like that sound still haunts me because it was such a dramatic and traumatic experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, these were some honey, tablespoons of honey that I took for energy mm. um, when things were kind of looking up or looking down, I should yeah. say. Um, and then what was interesting to me about uh, the experience of drawing the map was that I ended up kind of um, ex expanding on just like the timing of mm. it was like not only the moment of her birth, but also just right after. So like, this is the baby box of terror. <laughs> is she still breathing? Right. Um, changing pad exhaustion. My sleep, my pillow has no sleep on it. <laughs> um, so it just was really helpful to me to unlocking um, a very specific time period in my life that I'd never visited from this perspective. So it's really helpful. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, that's so awesome. And there's so much energy in this. And even like without people, you get this sense of like movement and dynamic energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, we're going to Jackie. My, my map came out a little wacky. Um, I don't know. I kept wishing that I was Chris Ware when I was drawing this. Oh, no. it's all those, like, you know, the building stories and the, the cutaways yeah. and everything. But um, I, so this, I, I drew um, what, well, I'll, I'll just hit it. But uh, th this is City Line Avenue uh, between the suburbs where I grew up uh, outside of Philly. This is Philly. Uh, everything on this side of City Line Avenue is Philly, and so I have like the air quote crack house, and here there be monsters, and then everything on this <laughs> side is the suburbs. I mean, the Balakin Wood. Um, there's the SEPTA, the, the 44G I used to take to get in town, and tra la la, pretty houses, safe neighborhoods, safe neighborhoods, or were they? <laughs> And here's Belmont Avenue. And I, I also live near a Belmont Avenue main thoroughfare here in Chicago. So pointing to the nice and here's everybody's well and here's our house. The overgrown lawn, got some pets here, sheep dogs, broken screen door. Um, and uh, this was is my room, and there's me crying in my underwear, the shag carpet that smelled like dog pee. Thank you, Natalie, for all the sensory <laughs> references, because like everything in my house smelled like pee. It was either like real, and my room was either too humid or too cold. And uh, you know, posters and stuff, but that's just my room for me. Right? So a little hard to make out. Um, yeah, so that that's I guess it, it's my room within Valley Kindred, which is within the Philadelphia area. Wow, yeah, I love how you have so many different like um, 
zooming in and zooming out and the little panel that shows inside the house. And then also I saw some people noting this in the chat, but the here there be monsters is such a yes. good addition of sort of like what is in this like unknown area. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh the big scary oh oh the city, you know. Right. That, that's <laughs> funny. Because now I live in the city and it's well right. We're not gonna go into what happened in the suburbs here this week. But, uh, well thank you so much. Thanks. No, thank you. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll go to Naomi. Uh, let's see. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, let's see. Um, so this is a room like other people have done. Um, mm -hmm. It's an infusion room for chemotherapy where I've been mm -hmm. last in the last year. So this is my, these are not well-developed pictures at all. Um, but it's a very small room and they smush about eight of these chairs these they look like lazy boy chairs um mm -hmm. and um people um get hooked up with the iv and there's these plexiglass plexiglass separations in between each chair and towards mm -hmm. um, this is backwards for me but the nurses do their um administrative stuff here and kind of get it all together there's um on the i can't um can't orient, but there's various um, uh, rollable uh, shelves where they have all the equipment. And um, in terms of feeling, well, it's it's really stressful. There was always pain. It's super boring. You can feel, I have cancer, you can feel the infusion um, going into your body. Mm -hmm. um, and then looking around, depending on where you are in your treatment, they give you various they call them pre-meds and some of them are really sedating and goofy. So the first mm -hmm. time that I was there, I was trying to make sense of well, what, what am I looking at? And here where it says ring the bell, there was this, it looked like magazine racks on the wall and there was a bell hanging from it. I really didn't understand it, but apparently when you finish your chemotherapy um, treatments, you get to ring the bell. <laughs> so that's, Kind of a big thing so there's the yeah. sounds it's not really smells unless somebody's eating something mm -hmm. but then there's the um the infusion stands um and they um make beeping noises for nursing checks um so it's very claustrophobic mm -hmm. all together and really not cared for at all i mean there's this old um chemo sign that's at the top there some grandkids wrote, congratulations, grandpa, on finishing your chemo 2018. So, wow. And these hideous, I didn't draw them, but these hideous pictures on the wall of really old landscapes. Mm. So it's pretty evocative. Um, it's a rough place to be. It's not, I hear about other places where you get chemo and you have a beautiful window to look at and they bring you all kinds of great snacks and that's not where I am. Yeah. So. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I really get a sense of like the claustrophobia and the sort of like sterile environment that yeah. definitely hospitals evoke. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank so, you. Thanks so much, Naomi. That's the moment. <laughs> we're going to go to Mishka. Natalie, you got time for a, couple, a few more? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go to Mishka, Susanna, Allison, and me. We'll see if Mishka's on our trampoline. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So I um, did this so I wouldn't. Um, this is a beach that I went to um, in junior high and part of high school uh, between Cabo San Lucas and Los Cabos. It doesn't, I, the beach exists, but it doesn't really exist like this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you paid a guy who told us his name is Felipe a couple of bucks a day to camp there. So we're <laughs> off there on the, what was that the left in the VW van and my daddy's barbecuing. Um, I'm in the three yellow spots. Um, sometimes I would go swimming in the really uh, huge waves that came in from the Pacific. Um, sometimes I felt like I was going to die. <laughs> Other times I felt like I was going to die because I would drown because I got sucked into snorkeling on the other side of the mm -hmm. ship. 
um, and Diana from, um, if anyone knows her, please put me in touch. Diana Morix from British Columbia came down with her family in a, a converted Greyhound bus that they slept in and uh, they came down every winter and so did we. Um, and she showed me all the best snorkeling spots. Wow. I love how you highlighted yourself and we can like see you interacting with the space in different ways. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Mishka. All right, see you later. Um, okay, we'll go to Susanna. Thank you. Oh, I think you're muted. Unmute. Hey. There you are. <laughs> so these are drying a little. They don't. Oh my gosh, I'm on this weird um, Zoom thing. So oh, right. the background's blurry. Maybe I should unmute. Maybe we put it right in the center. Oh. oh, this is so weird. Oh, I didn't know this. And there's no reason to blur the background. It's just a bunch of like a uh, frying pan. Oh, no. I thought maybe it wouldn't be, you know, like it would be nice to see something besides frying pans. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is too. Yeah. If you can maybe... turn that off, Susanna, it'll work. But if I can turn the blur off. There it oh. is. Yeah. Let me see. I will try to recreate. Okay, so I click on my name. Like that. Maybe edit, edit. Cheryl says, I like your frying pans. I've drawn them before. <laughs> oh my God. Sure, I mean, the best oh my frying God. Pans. I want to see the frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm doing this uh, Substack workshop with. Um, they like invite some of their newsletter writers and I just didn't want everybody to see the frying pans. I didn't feel as self-conscious in this group, but with those Substack people, I kind of did. So I took out the frying pans and now I'm just, oh gosh, I'm just, can somebody else go first and I'll try to get the- oh, good. We'll go to Allison. Here we go. Thanks, okay. Hello. Hi. Um, okay, so for my map, um, Ooh. I drew, uh, what I call the neighborhood run, um, back when I was, the school year was still going on. I started like just running around my neighborhood for 20 minutes and go all over the place. Mm -hmm. And, um, for me, um, the landmarks, if you will, are really just sort of the sights and sounds of the neighborhood. There mm -hmm. are always a ton of dogs. Um, mm -hmm. there's a Cooper's hawk that lives, um, in a tree nearby, um, there's this one, there's a ton of crows, but there's always this one strange crow that's like missing the top half of its beak. I don't know how it gets by, but it does. <laughs> um, and then just in terms of what else I hear, um, just the sound of my own breath <laughs> and yeah, that's it. Wow. I love how many of the things that you're noticing are animals give such a like intimate look to this place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Allison. Okay. Oh, Susanna's got it figured out. All oh, right. nice. <laughs> there we go. I'm unblurred. <laughs> this is my dad's study. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in Washington, DC, and I had, um, the, I think the study was probably a lot smaller than I'm remembering it. It was um, N Street, ran that way. And mm. I just remembered these, like those uh, big glass blocks that get put in windows and you can, the light gets through, but mm. they're sort of like um, kind of opaque. Well, it's, I mean, it's the light comes through, but nothing else. But then there was a real window in the front. So I kind of need to go modify that and say real window. And this was his Harvard chair. And it's like one of those old um, Hitchcock style chairs, just says Harvard on it, um, that my brother ended up getting later because my brother went to Harvard also. And so now Alex has the Harvard chair. Um, <laughs> this is the red-ish desk. It's the colors that I really remembered most distinctly. So this is dad's big red um, leather armchair. And this is the pipe he would smoke. Mm -hmm. and the smoke would curl up and he would blow smoke rings. And um, this is this um, bright orange clock that he had that was kind of a mid-century modern, like um, sort of when I 
think of it now, I realize, oh, it's like Helvetica and mid-century modern. But of course, I didn't realize at the time. This is the a model of the Saturn V. And they have a, a similar model at the Air and Space Museum now. And dad built it when he was working <laughs> for the Bureau of Management and Budget. And it, um, he put it together piece by piece. And it was really, really tall. And mm. then he had a um, picture of the ship that his... Uh, grandfather immigrated on over on from um, Hesse, Germany, and then this is his grandfather had a um, non-alcoholic liquor company during the depression, or no, during prohibition. Sorry, non-alcoholic mm -hmm. liquor company, was like one of his many businesses. But Dad had the poster for it. Mm -hmm. That um, this is a Scotch tape roll that I used to always take and play with so that I could make, um, I would try to make like uh, costumes with it, like with paper and scotch tape. And this is a, a book with a lot of bookshelves. I'm trying to draw this, um, it's like this, uh, this ashtray with this, um, I don't know, like dark wooden uh, old uh, German dude who has a long beard and is carrying a thing on his back, but it doesn't, I figured I'll, marker it in and this is a big hassock and um and then dad would um talk to me about the uh the different nasa programs but i didn't make room but here there's a door it would actually go to my brother's room and then all of these um tape pictures from the viking uh from the the viking and the pioneer and the the voyagers and um they were all Put up at exactly my height so that mm -hmm. I could look at them and follow the space programs as they went along. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I sort of think of it, I realized how much the space is about the conversations mm -hmm. and about these parts of my dad's history that that I would understand just from being in this room. And it surprised me how distinctly I remember the colors and shapes and it makes me want to share it with my nephews and with my dad. Oh, great. Um, this he remembers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the colors definitely stand out to me. And then especially the size of the pipe, you get this sense that it's sort of like dominating the room with the smell and just how much that has stuck in your memory. Oh, yeah. the smell was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there we go. We'll go to Umi next. Thanks, Susanna. There we go. Hi, uh, thank you. So this is what I did. Wow. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, so this is a takoyaki vendor that I used to go to. And this is close to the station that I didn't have anything to do with, actually. I don't know why I ended up there. But she was the first, my first counselor person. I think somebody who was not my parent. And I just walk like three minutes to the to the from the station to the nothingness. Like there's nothing, no mall, nothing mm -hmm. this side of the station. But I just walk to her place, and she was this person who didn't smile at all, and she was just like listening to me or nodding to me. And I don't really associate any smell or any taste of takoyaki because takoyaki in general is my favorite. Mm -hmm. So I don't. It was kind of mediocre takoyaki, mm -hmm. but I was a pack and there's this woman all the time, this woman who said nothing and she was just like sitting there and she occasionally moved her, the edge of her mouth to kind of like kept sweat away from her mouth, mm -hmm. but that was the smile and gestures that I saw. And so I said things like, oh, I found school time really necessarily boring and she's like, oh, school is such. And I said, like, oh, you know, everybody calls me stupid and blah, blah. And then she was like, oh, well, you know, me and this woman had, like, a really bad grade or something like that. <laughs> and I said, like, oh, so I'm, I'm really terrible at PE and art class. And she's like, just work your ass out and then you get stronger. <laughs> and then, like, why don't you just, like, a train? Well, and I, I, I drew this, this banner. Me, like this is my work, our work, <laughs> and this is so boring. But I was like, oh, okay, okay. I don't take her seriously. <laughs> and then she said, I, I said, like, 
well, but I don't know what people are going to say about me. They're going to laugh at me if I left school. And she said, like, well, any Japanese person will respect anybody who speaks English. Even mm. you know? So that was the dynamics that time. And so just, just put on the radio and learn English and draw. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I did. I, ke I keep doing it. So this is a really important memory for me. And thank you for wow. letting me vent this. This is important for me. Yeah. yeah, and I love how you already you took the map and then you just put it into a comic already, and that's so cool to see occupying the space. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, let's remove Spotlight. Amazing, Natalie, thanks so much for bringing this out of people. Um, so many great stories and, and really beautiful places and great memories and things like that. Mm -hmm. um so wow yeah i think <laughs> i think you'll probably I, I hear have a request Tom, yeah. can you share yours please oh, oh great right. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, i'll highlight mine i'll just explain it's a bowling alley um and, oh, oh my gosh <laughs> there should be 52 lanes but i only managed to draw 29 i was just you <laughs> and, and where and where everybody would sit um, and there was always a little ashtray here. And these were the tables that you would hang out on. And this is the bar and that's the pro shop. This is the main counter. This is where you'd get fries and, and uh, cheeseburgers. Mm -hmm. Only thing of real note, I'll post this on Instagram or something, is this thing, it was a ball washing machine and it would scare the heebie-jeebies out of me <laughs> because when it was done, the door would open and the ball would just spill out. And it really scared me. <laughs> but I spent tons and tons of hours at the bowling alley growing up. So thanks, Jim. Yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of stories that will come out of this location. Yeah, that's a little intense. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's everybody um, join uh, join Susan at the after party. Let's see if I still have that. Okay, it's in the chat. And join me in taking your. Uh, going off mute and thanking Natalie for doing this. Natalie, thanks again. Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. So good. Natalie. Good. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Have a beautiful weekend, everyone. Yeah, have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to everybody who shared and opened up. Thanks, Shay and Naomi and everybody who, who shared. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. All right.